insurance program. <laughs> My name is Philip Murphy. I'm from Echo Park, near your office. Um, I've been to your copies before. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for holding these things. I feel like this is democracy and work. I really appreciate you Thanks doing this. Thank you. Um, that being said, I'm going to bring up two points that really make me hot under the collar, and we've addressed one to some degree here. The two issues, as you're going to hear over and over, impeachment. I, are you familiar with the scholarship of Bruce Fine? Yes. The, the constitutional yes. lawyer, conservative, Republican, yes. goes right out front and says, if we do not impeach this president, these will set the, the overreaching that's been done by this White House, not only deception, overreaching, and possible crimes, will be set as precedent for the next president, whoever that may be, and future presidents. It's not an exercise in punishment. It is an exercise in, in the con exercising the democracy that we have, the constitution that we have, respecting that constitution. Otherwise, we turn a blind eye to it. We're complicit in their actions by not addressing them as they need to be addressed, addressed firmly, and decisively, we may not. You may not have enough Democrats to get this through Congress, but you, I think, as citizens of this country, are obligated to put aside the idea that it's not practical to do this. It may not be practical, but it's absolutely vital. That's that's just the first thing I want to say. I am really pissed off. About that. Thing that I am also very concerned about is our free election system, which I think the last two national elections that we've had, the results are questionable, to put it mildly. I'm, I'm not going towards 2008 with a, a sense of optimism that things are going to go any different then. I don't know why anybody else would. I think a lot of people that I know feel like our, our you know, election system is not working. And if it's not working, what kind of democracy do we have? I don't even think these guys should be in office. And so let me try to okay. get you to wind down. So what can we do about this election system? This should be number one issue, I think, for the Democrats. Uh, Phil, first, on your, fir uh, on your first issue, um, I don't know if I could respond any better to what you pointed out than what you said. I, I, we all recognize that the elements are out there that make it make the president impeachable and trying to figure out how to best make the case that not only do we rid ourselves of that type of offensive activity within the White House, but make sure it never happens again is critical. And, I, I, and I'm very privileged to be the assistant to the speaker, so I have a chance to sit in these, in, the, in essence, the kitchen cabinet in the House to determine the direction of the House um, uh, activities, the legislative agenda. And I can't tell you how many, how much of our agenda is taken up by this very conversation about how we get there. It, the minds, and some excellent minds, have been discussing this and how we try to make the case. And I, all I can tell you is that it's very frustrating that we can't get further along where you are saying, but I will tell you this, please make no mistake, we are trying in every way possible to find the nook and cranny that gets us to where you're, what you're talking about doing. On the second point, Congressman um, Rush Holt from New Jersey has legislation that deals precisely with what you're concerned about, which you all should be concerned about, and that is uh, an election with integrity. And we are trying to make sure that there is no election that takes place again that does not have a paper trail that gives you a, a, the evidence of what you did and how you voted. And we're trying to do that and this is the frustrating part. It's bogged down, not even so much by partisan politics, now it's regional politics. New York was concerned for the longest time that the legislation would deny them access to their lever voting machines. You know, they can vote by a lever device which lets them vote down the line. And, and so New York was objecting to that. We were supposed to have this bill passed out of the House two weeks ago. And so we're hoping this next week when we come in, we will be able to pass it. It's been tough because, again, it's, that's what happens in a democracy. Everybody gets to add their little two cents. And it, those two cents are very valuable at the end of the day. But I, I think there I can tell you, well, no, I won't say that. <laughs> there I think we're going to be able to tell you that the, the House and the Senate will agree whether the president signs the bill is another matter. And once again, it's not, a, it's not majority rule today. Recognize that. Right now it's 
minority political rule because the president through his veto can ensure that a third of the Congress can stop anything from occurring. Right. Okay, and that's why you all have to be vigilant and continue to, as Philip, you said, just be out there and be aggressive. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, on Iraq, I have a friend who's a veteran uh, advocate, and I'm against the war as well. But one of the things is, from what I understand, and you can tell me if this is true or not, National Guard members who serve in Iraq are not given medical benefits, nor are they given anything that the enlisted officers are. Is there anything that the majority party in the Congress can do to make sure that this happens because it's a travesty that the president and his party have done nothing for folks who have fought on the National Guard? I, I feel like you guys take about two or three days of your life and do homework and get preparation for, <laughs> for my town halls because you guys are asking great questions. Um, on that question, remember, National Guard and Army Reserve were never meant to be full-time soldiers. Today, that's what they are. They are full-time soldiers. And talk to some of them who've lost their marriage, who've lost their job, lost their house. The, the accommodations under the law for those who are temporary soldiers, the emergency force, is not equal to that for the, mili the regular force, full-time force. And it's taken a long time for the president to acknowledge that he is treating our temporary force as a full-time force. He's also then not willing to devote the monies that it's taken to treat them like what they are. This year, in this House, uh, veterans, we passed a bill, uh, appropriations bill, as part of our budget in the House. Unlike the President's proposed budget, the House budget will increase the size of veterans, the Veterans Affairs programs by more than it has ever been increased. We put in over $3 billion extra simply for veterans' health care for those who are coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. Just for that, because we know how bad it's going to be. We've already seen the signs. It will be worse than we have ever seen. And that's just for that. We know there's still money that we have to put in for the veterans from the previous wars who weren't getting full service. We've also tried to convince the president that he has to treat the temporary force as what it is, a full-time force. But once again, it costs money. And the president, as I said to you before, is unwilling to increase those spending items without seeing commensurate cuts. Where does he want to see the cuts? Education, housing, uh, EPA, and we're saying, no, you can't do that. So guess what? The heavy lifting is being left to the Congress to figure out not only where to find the money for the veterans, including veterans from the uh, National Guard and Army Reserve, but for everything else. And we have to figure out how to do that without hurting somebody, someone else, while at the same time, we're not going to increase the size of the, the Bush deficits. Because remember, when President Bush took office, we had surpluses. And today, we've got massive deficits. So we're trying to avoid increasing those deficits. But we've got to do it at the same time while we're still being responsible for the veterans, the school kids, uh, elderly, and all the rest. And so it's a tough one. But we're going to get there because we, think, we believe we have an obligation to help those. If, if, you, if you're sent off to fight, and we want you to have the best when you're fighting, we should, we should be prepared to give you the best once you've come back from fighting. And uh, I think this, this Congress has made that commitment. It may take us a while because we're going to be in a fight with the President on how to fund it. We may not always win because, of, once again, he can veto. But we're going to put it out there for him. That's the difficulty in trying to move, whether it's on impeachment, Iraq, or veterans. When you've got this opposition that's entrenched, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs>